Thank you. Um, before I, I do my presentation, I just, just want to say how, how pleased I am to be here. Um, I've never been to Denmark before, um, so it was, a, it was a first for me, and that was probably why I was uh, persuaded to come along. Um, when, I, when I knew, um, knew I was coming here, the first thing is I, I tried to work out how did I pronounce Owensa. You know, I've, I've done it in lots of different ways, and I probably haven't done it right yet, but forgive me. So from now on, I'll say your city. Um, I think that'll help me. Um, but I did, I did, I tried to research it a little bit, um, and I was really surprised how similar the, um, the, the most recent, so let's say the post-industrial history of, 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 of your city has been um, in, in parallel to Nottingham, because the, the similarities were re really, really quite, quite marked, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them, them here so you can sen get a sense of that yourself. So, and even, it's not just the history, I think it's the, it's the way that you've decided to move the city forward as well. You know, the, some of the things I've seen in the short time I've been here with, um, with the development out here and, and knowing about the tram and the route that the tram's going to take the, to the new hospital, you know, they're exactly the things that are happening in, have happened and are happening in Nottingham. So, you know, that, that, that ambition that you've got is very similar to the Nottingham ambition. So I hope some of the things I'm going to talk about um, will, will help you with, with moving forward in that ambition. You know, there's some areas where you're a little bit further ahead than Nottingham, cycling, you know, you're way ahead of Nottingham on. On things like that um, but you know we want to be a cycling city so w we need to learn from that but there's other areas where maybe we are a little bit advanced and the tramway may be one so hopefully what I'm what I'm talking about will be um, hopefully um, entertaining but also relevant to, to some of your your thinking that you, you're gonna you're gonna be doing over the next exciting few years so um, a little bit about Nottingham I'm gonna stand over here so I can I can see that um, it's a regional city um, it's the eighth biggest city in the UK. Um, it's got a population of 315,000. Um, the built-up area around it, the wider conurbation, is, 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 is just over twice that. So it's you know, 700,000 um, plus. Um, what's important, because it's in the centre of the, U the UK, um, it's about as far away from, from the sea you can get. In, in the UK, so it hasn't got a, a history of shipbuilding or, any, or anything like that because of, its, because of its location. But it means it is in a position that actually can, it can see itself as an advantage because there are, there are over two and a half million uh, people who could get to the city um, in an hour. Um, so it, it's got the opportunity if it's got something to offer. Um, the population's young. I think that's a, that's a common thing across, across Europe now. We've got two major universities, Nottingham University and Nottingham Trent University, which the 60,000 students in that 315,000 um, people. That's in um, university education, not, not secondary education. There's even more, even more in that. It's got an economy worth 222 million um, billion, and there's been around a billion pounds worth of investment in the city in, in the last five years. So it's, it's, it's doing okay coming out of that post-industrial stage, but it's, it's probably got, still got a fair way to go yet. Um, so. The theme, you know, picking up with that theme, there's about 50 national or regional HQs in the city. Um, some of them are picked out. Paul Smith Fashion Brand is uh, HQ is Nottingham. Alliance Boots, Experian Credit Card Company, Nottingham Forest, which we've already we've already touched on. They were good ones. Um, <laughs> and they may rise again, even with Nicholas Bentner playing for them. Um, and obviously Robin Hood. Um, that's the that's the city's brand, really. Um, it suffered from significant decline of heavy industry, mining mainly in, in, in the 1980s. Um, so the city became a much more important place for employment, training, um, the life of the, of the area. Um, it was initially a lot of service industry that came in, so relatively low value service industry. So the ambition is to actually um, improve the, um, the productivity of the city by moving to more high technology um, um, industries and we're making some progress we've, we're developing bio city and we have a science park which I know is something that you are you are working working through as well um, we've massively increased the links with the universities in terms of driving the local economy so that the city council the um, the two universities and the rest of the business community are focused on some growth areas so medical growth 
is it medi medical technology is an area where we're, we're, where we're focusing on. Um, and, it's, and it's reaping, reaping re rewards. Um, but it's a, but it, like all cities, it's a, it's a difficult, difficult market out there. But the key, one of the key things there, though, is that if the city's going to be important, and the connectivity be between all the, uh, all the various parts of the city, the universities, etc., is going to work, we need the best accessibility we can have. And that's where the tram line comes in. I'm sure everybody's seen that sort of slide before, you know? It's obvious, you know? Trams are really, really good at moving lots of people quickly and reliably. The logic of why, you know, why did Nottingham have the vision for trams in, it was late 1980s it really started driving, a public-private partnership as well. It wasn't just the municipality that drove it. In fact, I, I personally believe it was the, um, the business community that drove the trams in Nottingham initially, and then the municipality jumped on board when they saw it was a good idea. Um, but why did they look at it? Fast and reliable, you know, you can, you can bypass roads. Um, sometimes you've got to be on roads, but, but you can bypass roads um, quite easily in the urban area. You can share some of the, uh, the public spaces. You know, this is a main pedestrian street in, in the city of Nottingham with the, this is the town hall um, on the right with the market square behind it. When we, we used to have buses in that area and we had lots of problems with buses. You know, that conflict between people and buses, notwithstanding fumes and, and such. Um, trams do it a lot, a lot more easily in those areas. Um, all the evidence says trams amongst all you know, apart from when you start going to metros, of all modes, trams can have that real big hit on modal shift. Um, and we use park and ride sites, which I'll, I'll touch on in a minute, as to drive that modal shift. And this is one of our, one of our park and ride sites. Um, as you see, already full. We could do with, we could do with building some more. Um, it's linked to that, that bit about um, the value of accessibility. It's really popular with developers, you know. They like fixed infrastructure that they can rely on and they can bank. And that's what those, tram those rails in the road do. So it's helped with investment within the city. Um, it's, but it's not just a city. We've used it as a catalyst for regeneration in, 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 in parts of the city that are perhaps not, as, um, not doing as well as other areas. So this is the Meadows area of the city where, where an old, um, pretty derelict part of the city with some old um, 60s housing has been given a massive facelift with the tram going through and it's, it's, it's completely transformed the, the area. And it's had, had, had knock-on benefits like reduction in crime and antisocial behaviour, etc. And it's brought more ambition to the area. Um, which is really, really, really key. Um, that's the same place, but you can do it in an environmentally friendly way, obviously, with, um, with the, um, uh, the electric wires being in the air, so they're not polluting in, this, in, in, the, in the urban areas. Um, you can make them really safe. Um, you can control them well. And I think this is really important. And, and, and we found this massively in Nottingham. It creates a pride in the city. Um, it's not just pride that politicians and... and can utilise. It's actually prize that the people really, really want. And whenever you see any anything about Nottingham on the news, or or if they do, um, you know, got, we do a lot in media in, in Nottingham. Um, there might be a TV programme filmed in Nottingham. The, the credits will always have a tram on it. The story will always have a tram in it, because that's the sort of thing that that, that relates with people. So it, it's been a massive civic pride issue in Nottingham. Um, a little bit about the detail. Um, so that's the background, really. A little bit about the detail. Um, it doesn't really matter about, about the route particularly, but um, this is Nottingham City Centre's here. The first route was all the way to Hucknall, so that's our 14-kilometre route. As uh, Stane said, that all first routes are 14 kilometres long, whichever city you go to in the world. Um, ours was 14 kilometres. It was th actually 13 kilometres from Nottingham Railway Station through the heart of the city centre to Hucknall with a short spur to a park and ride site at a place called Cinder Hill. Um, the sort of ambition of that was, was, was fundamentally about, that was the most, con they were the two most congested radio road corridors coming into the city. Um, so it was logical, put some, put some improved public transport in that corridor and you reduce the congestion, and it did. Um, it was also to connect a part of the, uh, the conurbation, particularly as you got towards Hucknall, that has suffered from that coal mining um, those coal mines being, and collieries being closed. Um, so it allowed people from that area 
to the north of Nottingham to get into the city f t t to seek available work and training, etc. So that was the first route. That was um, we opened that up in March 2004. So we we let the contract for that in 2000. Um, it was around the 200 million pound um, project at the time. Even before we started um, operating in 2004, we were already developing phase two. We'd already put in the, in the planning powers for, for phase two. Um, and eventually in August, 18 months ago, we opened, we opened up that two new lines um, to the southwest and the west of the city um, at a cost of around 500, 500 million pounds. Um, I'll touch on where they go to in a minute, but they were, they were the ones, that was the, to some extent, that was the easier one because it followed a railway corridor. These were the two more, um, more ambitious ones that serve some key locations like the university and the hospitals. Um, more difficult to build, more urban, urban um, working, but got you to the places you really wanted to, wanted to get to. I'm not going to bore you too much with this, but the way Nottingham let their contract was under a private finance deal. So we let it to a concession company. Um, gave, get, actually gave them the opportunity to earn um, all the fair, uh, set the fares, earn the revenues, because we don't have um, a franchise public transport in the UK, we have a, a free-for-all. Um, so it's market driven, bus companies compete with train companies and tram companies compete with train companies. It's nonsense, but that's what we do. Um, and in that framework, um, we let a concession, 23 year concession, this is phase two actually, we let we added an original 30-year concession for line one, which we terminated. So we've got a 23-year 23, 23 concession, and the responsibility for delivering um, the operations, new lines, was passed to an organisation called Tramlink. They've got some major vent venture capital um, in them. Um, Meridium and Infravera are arms of um, Kalis and Vinci in, in France. Um, and they let two contracts, one construction contract to Taylor Woodrow, which is Vinci, um, that's a UK arm of uh, Vinci and Alstom to design and build the new lines, provide the new, new trams and um, an operating concession to uh, Kalis. I think I saw Kalis, Kalis's brand name on the railway, one of the railway station buildings as I, as I passed by earlier. Uh, the funding for it, 65% um, of the funding came from central government, 35% of the funding came from um, what's called a workplace parking levy. Um, I don't think there is one anywhere else in the world. There are things like it elsewhere in the world, but I think this is unique, um, which is a tax, called a levy, but a tax on businesses um, within the city boundary that any one of those that provides more than 11 car parking spaces for their employers to use, to commute to, they have to pay um, a, a fee every, every year for that, for that, um, that space. Um, at the moment, that's about just less than £400 a space in the UK. It's ramped up over a period and then it's just going to go up for inflation. That generated, um, in the first three years, £25 million to go towards public transport. The lion's share is for the tram. It was designed, actually, to, f to get the tram funding. Um, but we also used it to run um, electric link buses in parts of the community that which weren't commercially viable, and also to upgrade Nottingham Railway Station, which is a beautiful old building, but the passengers were in, in 1950s-style um, accommodation, and the quality was really poor. So we used that to upgrade that. Um, it was a, ma a massive political step. You know, the politicians made a, a major commitment to, to the tram by doing that. Um, it could have gone terribly wrong. It actually is r really, really simple to operate. We have 100% compliance across the city, 100% compliance. Um, we've not had to take anybody to court for, for trying to avoid it or not paying it. It has a team of about six people that administer it, and it's basically just administered through the normal rating systems that get paid through the various account systems within the public sector. It really works. Um, and I'm not just saying that, you know, it, it, it really, really works. You know, there might be an argument about what, why it's there and why it's just picking on commuters and businesses, but if you get past that bit, it really works. Um, and obviously what it did do is we got a tram for it. We've got a railway station for it, and it's leaving in a lot of other money as well. So we really like it. No other city in the UK has done it. It's politically difficult. Yeah. Nottingham can do it because 
of the 49 seats, 47 of them are controlled by the Labour Party. So there's a stability. They were still worried about it. I had some very difficult sessions with the leader of the City Council about it. Because I invented, well, no. Together with, <laughs> together with a company called PricewaterhouseCoopers, we invented that, how to make that work, because we had to find the 35%. So, what do we do? We've got 37 trams now with the extensions. Um, got 51 tram stops. Um, most of them are well used, some of them are not, not very well used. Probably you get rid of a few of them. Um, we run every seven to 10 minutes across the city from out the outlying corridors. We run every day of the year apart from Christmas day and from 6 a.m. to midnight. Um, and I picked up on the point before, it's probably one of the u more unique things about Nottingham system. Um, we've got seven park and ride sites of five, nearly five and a half thousand spaces. Um, we've got integration at various railway stations, um, not, not, not just Nottingham railway station, but local railway stations as well. We integrate with bus services, albeit in a, a, um, a non-regulated market. So they're doing it because it's a good idea and there's sensible facil good facilities there for them to do that. Um, we do have a Robin Hood card which is um, an integrated multimodal ticket. Um, it, it, it does the job, but there's a premium for it. So we're trying to drive the premium down. Um, so, and park and ride again, very important. What, what's the reliability like? What does it do? Um, it's 95% reliable um, so it, and punctual. So it runs trams and it runs trams to timetable. So it has really good reliability. 96% um, of customers who use it are satisfied with it. That's, the, that's a national survey. That's the highest satisfaction um, result in the UK. 30% of Line 1 journeys are former car users or use park and ride. I actually think the figure's slightly higher than that. Um, so that's that modal shift impact because of those park and ride sites, mainly because of those park and ride sites. Public transport grew in, in the Nottingham Conurbation from 67 million people in 2004. It's now up to 78 million in 2016. We've now got 15 million-ish tra tram users um, in 2016, and that's, with, that's only got 18 months of the new lines being operational. What does it do? It provides access to just over 1,200 workplaces where 55,000 55, employees commute from, two. So it's two of the three biggest employers in Greater Nottingham. Um, the University of Nottingham and the Queen's Medical Centre. So this is the equivalent of the hospital that you're, you're building. That's how close we get to the, to the buildings. I don't know whether you're going to beat us or not, but we've got a viaduct with a tram stop, which, can, which has the main university teaching hospital um, on one side and the new diagnostic centre on the other side. Um, there's 7,000 employees um, in both of those, and I can't, I can't remember the figure for, for, for um, visitors and patients, but it's a lot. Um, and, it, and so we actually serve 20 of the 30 biggest employees in the city now with the, with the more recent extensions. We project, and we're only 18 months in, that we'll, it will actually generate, um, the, the new lines will generate 8,000 jobs, which, which in, num, in, in money terms is £300 million towards the Nottingham economy. Um, there's no doubt it's a strong catalyst for development. The doubters say, yes, but other, there are other factors. Yes, there are other factors. But there are loads of examples that we've got of developments taking place on plots of land that have been sat like that for 10 years, and then the tram comes along, and suddenly somebody puts some houses on it. Suddenly there's a, a new um, supermarket in that location. That was particularly so with Hucknall, which was at the northern end of the line. So the old colliery site, within a year of the tram starting construction work, had a new retail centre and... I think about 400 houses built on the old colliery site. And we have similar, similar, similar um, examples within, within the city. Um, so it really has enhanced Nottingham's offer to, to get that investment in. I mentioned the redevelopment of Nottingham Railway Station earlier. Um, it, it, it allowed that to happen. One of the things we've used it to do as well on the new lines is we've put ducting in so we can put super fast broadband in. So we can get broadband connectivity at w wider in the conurbation. I think we're probably behind Europe and I think America in, in, in rolling out uh, broadband. Um, but we've put infrastructure in that makes it a lot easier. And we've sold that concession now and it's starting to be rolled out into those, into those corridors. Just a bit about the construction work, because I know that's, 
it's going to be your next stage. So I think it's right for me to, to talk to you a bit about it. So the net phase two, as I mentioned earlier, back in the 2011, we let the contract to the people I talked about earlier. Um, the plan was it would be done in, um, in um, three years. It was um, three years, eight months. So it was longer. Some difficult days in that construction activity. Um, it was, the contract had difficult problems. I won't go into the commercial side of it, but it's not their most profitable uh, venture, I don't think. Um, but it was 17 kilometers of new double track, some big structures, which I'll show you some pictures of in, in a second, 27 new tram stops. We added two, nearly 2,500 tram stops in two main park and ride sites on the, the bottom of those two, those two southerly lines. 50 million pounds with ut utility diversions done, a bit like you're, 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 you've got underway now. Um, but we let the contractor do that. That was our decision. I think, it, I think you can do it both ways. You're doing it one way, which got a lot of sense, and I can see it's been um, well managed. Um, you, can do it, you can do it different ways. Um, we had to expand the depot. Um, so we didn't need another depot. We could use the site we had, but we had to maximize, max, max out the space we had. We knocked a lot of property down. We didn't do, knock a lot of property down on line one, but we had more ambition on phase two. So we made the decision, actually, we need to have a reliable tramway. Things have to go. So we did. Um, and we CPO, uh, compulsory purchase order, 500 plots, um, and said overall it's about 500 million. 50 million was around was for the land. I'm not going to, you know, it's not, it's not easy to see, but um, the, uh, the purple line, the, 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 the extensions, um, uses an old railway corridor. So it goes to some, some residential areas reasonably quickly because it's using an old residential corridor. Once it gets over the River Trent, um, at Wolford Village, it's, on, it's off street there, so it can run quite quickly. And then it comes into an area called Clifton, which once in the 70s was the biggest public housing estate in Europe. Um, it's been beaten now. Um, and then out to a park and ride site um, at the south of Clifton, just over a 1,000 spaces. The green line, lots of built-up area, but serves some real jewels. So NG2 development site, one of our major, biggest, biggest high-quality development sites um, in Nottingham. Um, for maybe four years before, before it um, was, was, was fully, fully there, all its branding and banner was trams coming. So they, that was developers putting their money in. They saw the value um, of, that, of that site. It was an old armory, armory site. Um, and then to, um, once you get to Old Lenton, the, the, the grey area, Queen's Medical Centre is the main hospital, as we've touched on. Nottingham University, main built-up area of a town called Beeston and Chilwell, and then to a park and ride site. And then as you go a little bit further, um, it's, it's about a mile and a half away from the M1, which is the main motorway that comes, comes from, through Nottingham. And that key, key part, serve some real good destinations, serve the built-up area, but get park and ride sites so it relieves radial routes into the city. I'm just going to have a, a really quick canter through some of the pictures of the construction work. Um, we, we had some quite big structures to build, actually. Um, we didn't have as many big structures on line one. This is at Nottingham Station, where we, we built a, a, new, a new bridge over the top of the railway station with a tram stop sat on the top. Um, and this was it being um, uh, fabricated adjacent to the site. Um, all the preparation work for the bridge on one side. And then it was slid over um, on, on bearings. And we got on national TV with this one um, because we used fairy liquid. Do you know fairy liquid? Uh, liquid soap. That was used to make sure there wasn't, wasn't any friction as it was uh, rolled over. So rather than on national TV, you know, 100 and odd, uh, meter long bridges being built. It was bridges pushed over a railway station using fairy liquid. But it got, it got the coverage. Um, and and it, like all these things, the logistic effort with the National Rail Organization was massive. Uh, but the reason we did that, it, it meant we did not need to close the railway station down while it was being done. And there you go. That's it. That's, um, that's the uh, main Loxley House. That's where I live. Um, that's my office. Um, that's the main public building in, in the public use building. It's not the town hall, that's further away. That's where all the staff, all the staff are. Um, there's the trams on top of the, top of the station. We had to go over another railway. 
where we use this clever um, uh, roller, you know, multi-wheeled um, tracker to manoeuvre the bridge over the over the railway lines. That was that was done on a, uh, a railway possession from Netrail, Network Rail over a weekend, and there it is in there it is in place. These are moving out from the city centre just to give you a feel of of, of how it how it's working. So as I move along the pictures, we're gradually going going out of the city centre. Um, this is the Queen's Medical Centre, so this is building the big viaduct in the Queen's Medical Centre. We not only had to go, we had to get into the Queen's Medical Centre, and the reason we ended up on a viaduct was because either side of the, the Queen's Medical Centre is a river that we had to go over, and the main Nottingham Ring Road. And we couldn't get up and down, so we had to stay in the air and put a tram stop at first floor level. So this is building the, uh, building the, um, the viaduct. This is the bridge that went adjacent to it, went, went over the... Um, the, the ring road, um, and that's how close we were to the hospital. So, the, you know, but like you will have, are you built? No, you're building the hospital after the, the tramway or before? Same time. Same time, well, there you go. You've got all that stuff to do, all those really good stuff when, when the hospital administration says to you, are you going to switch the heart monitors off every time a tram goes past? That sort of question you're going to get. So, you get lots of stuff. Um, so, the, the biggest issue we had actually with that one was because we built that in, in the, um, in, on, on a, a piece of land within the hospital, biggest issue, you've taken away some of our highly paid consultants' car parking spaces. They're upset. So we had to find a way where the highly paid consultants got some more car parking spaces in a place where they weren't upset. Um, that was probably the biggest challenge we had. Um, and that's the trams coming across, off the viaduct um, on the, um, the city-bound city -bound side. Um, as you do, we made as much as we could of the publicity of the positive side of the construction, because there's lots of negatives. Um, so this was done one weekend where we, we shut the, um, the A52 ring road for that, for that period, so we could, again, using that, those, that clever bit of kit that, that wheels it across the road, um, I haven't got the picture here, but there was a street party taking place next to it where people had come out to watch. And there were hundreds of people thinking, this is great, we can go on the main ring road. And there were kids playing football, um, taking photographs of the, of the new bridge, which did successfully go in over a weekend. And that's the Bowstring Bridge um, looking from the other way. Um, this was an old, uh, an old footbridge um, that we widened and um, had to alter. Again, we had to deal with all the statutory bodies and we had interesting conversations with the fishing clubs that, uh, that were under there and we said that we were disturbing the uh, carp fishing during the carp season, but, but there you go. Um, we had some other, other, other um, sensitive locations. This, is the, this was a greenway that ran um, on the route once you got past the university go, and, and the hospital going, going west. Um, it was an area that had terrible drainage problems. Um, this is what it, what it was like before we, before we went there. It was sensitive because it was an area that actually was, was, was well used by the public. It was a linear um, corridor. So it was an area where we, we had some challenging local pressure groups, local people who were, a lot of them were, were quite vehemently against the tram. So we had to work with them and manage them. I'll talk about a little bit about stakeholder management in a second. Um, that's what it is now. Um, interestingly, they didn't want grass track. Um, I wasn't that convinced by grass track at the time because our experience of grass track in the UK is it's people don't maintain it properly, it becomes a mess and we have stray current problems and in the UK the stray current code with utility companies is challenging, it's, it's more challenging, in fact the whole relationship with utility companies I've, I've, I've learned today is, is more challenging in the UK because I can't believe that you don't have to pay the utility companies to move utilities because in the UK you pay a fortune to get utilities moved. Um, but. It was, so we, we didn't put um, grass track in, which is probably a location where you could. But we've got a corridor now that's actually, um, it works. People walk their dogs. Um, there are two nice parks at either end, so you walk between the two and, and get to the park. So it, it works okay, but it was difficult to build. Um, this was another location um, where, again, it was a green corridor, where we had to take an inner row of trees out um, that was very sensitive. Um, in, 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 but we had to, um, we had to. So again, it was another one of those locations where we had to work very hard to work with the local community. Um, in fact, it was an area where we we did some local sculpture with the local community, which I think I've got a slide of in a second to to, to keep them on board. Um, and that's actually that that Queen's Walk. That's that location now, which again is a. It was that area I mentioned earlier, which had some social 
social problems which we've now managed to turn certain people to look at look at the corridor um, and it's much a, it's, a, it's a lovely environment now actually when we got into Beeston um, we wanted to build a public it was tight tight area of land and we wanted to build a public transport interchange so we knocked an old car park down to provide us enough enough land and we ended up being able to put a put a public transport interchange in where the buses and the trams could uh, could exchange um, and that's worked really well that, that's one of the uh, we get we get what actually has happened, which is interesting, that even though, even though we've got a, um, a deregulated public transport network, so the buses could still compete, what's happened is the buses have decided that they don't want to compete with the tram because it's better. So the vast majority of people now in Beeston will catch the tram and the buses will feed from outlying areas, which is common sense when you think about it in, in public transport operations. But they've had to do that commercially. They haven't been forced to do that. Um, we went through some very difficult locations. So this is a this this is a about a 400 long um, road. Um, there was Lower Road and there was Fletcher Road. It was two cul-de-sacs, and in between was an old people's home that had been allowed to be built in the late 70s. We wanted to go straight through because it was the obvious route to go. Didn't want to go around side routes. So the decision was made: we were going to go down that route. We got the planning powers. We had to knock two-thirds of the old people's home down which is a challenge in itself in dealing with that um, and then we had to we had to build the tramway in a very tight confined area it was complicated by the fact that the ground conditions were terrible it was peat it was peat based ground conditions similar to the area I showed you before with the water so we had to build a concrete bridge under the road level in that area with piled foundations to then put the tramway on top in an area where it was a residential area. They probably had nearly two years worth of intense construction in that area. It wasn't easy. The politicians did not find it easy in that area. I didn't find it easy in that area. I had massive sympathy for the people, but you've got to work. I'll come to stakeholders in a second. What we really did benefit from, though, is we never shied away from the discussions. We always faced up to the people whatever it was, whether it was through social media, whether it was through meetings, whatever it was, whether it was through individuals, we put people out there on the ground, we forced the contractor to have people with hard hats out there on the ground explaining why they were digging holes at nine o'clock at night, or why the water had been cut off at 10 o'clock at night, why the next morning people hadn't got gas because of something happened. It wasn't always like that, but those circumstances arose. So, you know, they're, diff they're really difficult, those areas. Um, remember Lower Road, there were two, two or three very vociferous residents on Lower Road who were very, very... In fact, one of them ended up being a local political um, candidate and, and got elected as a party member on the local council. This wasn't in the city area, this was outside the city, city boundaries, um, and stood against the Labour council in that area, a um, lady called Alison Dobbs. So that's how bad she was at the time. I'll come back to her in a minute. We had another residential... We had another... Um, street, which was which was a local um, um, retail area and, and, and restaurant area, relatively small shops, you know, sort of unique, independent type shopping area, had a sort of bohemian feel feel to it. Again, we took some properties down on one side of the road on a narrow section because you could not fit double tramway in the area, um, and obviously the, the construction was a challenge. And that, that was an area where we had to put had to put um, special track construction, noise mats, etc., um, so we could dampen down noise um, for when the completed system was built. That's, that's what it is, that's what the environment is now. And this area here was where we knocked a row of, of properties down. Um, and we had a depot expansion. So I hope that gives you sort of flavour for um, what we did. How did we try and manage it? We had a code of construction practice um, that we constantly challenged the contractor with. So that was contractually imposed by us and by regulatory bodies. So they knew what they had to do. So they had to work with us and we required resources from the contractor to help us undertake stakeholder management. That's why I asked you questions like that, that earlier. Um, they were required to minimise impacts on the street environment. They had to control noise and vibration but that was tended to be policed by environmental health through statutory processes rather than contractual. Working hours were controlled and then again 
control of dust and protection of trees came through the planning process. And we, and we, used, we, we explained that to the public. So this is part of the compact with the public that that's how it would be, how it would be built. So we got, that, we got that in place. We also had a big communications team talking to, to the communi communi communications team. It's a similar size to what you've got. And, and we needed it. So I think you're probably about right. Um, we also required the contractor to have community li dedicated co community liaison staff on site to be able to communicate, to work with us, but also to be used to communicate with local people who wanted to know on an hourly basis sometimes, if they had deliveries, what was going on. Um, and then we used all the various outlets to, to communicate with people. Social media was growing when we were doing this. It's obviously grown even more now, so it's even more important. So probably social media needs to go right much higher on that, on that page. Um, so I mentioned the area where we took a load of trees down, so we, we worked with them to get local artists in place um, to um, carve trees with, a, with, with the history of the area. We did one or two things like that in, in areas. It didn't need a lot of our time, but it really helped with the local communities. So some of the lessons I think we, we got from all this, the point social media is, is there now, you've got to front, front it up, it's, it's immediate. You've got to engage with people in, in, our, in our view. I think you've got to be open and honest. Um, and the challenge is not to overpromise people. So it's easy to go to a meeting and say it'll be like this. But actually, you're going to get caught. So you've got to face up with the reality that things will go wrong, but you will work with them to help them, help them deal with that. And we found that particularly with um, um, retail outlets, where we had to work with, with people as really hard to help to minimise the impact. We forced the contractor to, to not think that they were immune to all this, that they could just go and dig holes or put track in. So we required them. And, and I, had, I had numerous meetings with, with very senior people in um, Vinci and Alstom in particular to make sure that they got that. When, and then that got passed down to their people because um, it was really important to us. One thing that um, I'm sure you know is that the more advocates you have, the more champions you can get within your own organisations, the better. Because it gets challenging. They don't always believe me, they won't always believe these guys. But there's more people saying, actually, this, they're, they're doing a good job and this is happening, there's a light at the end of the tunnel, really helps. What we did do and we focused on is we tried very hard to get local people jobs on the construction. And I don't know what it's like in, in Denmark, but uh, it was a bit haphazard in the UK, so we, we had to put a lot of effort in. Um, and we, we made pretty good success, so 40% of the people working on the construction were from the Nottingham area. Um, we made it as easy as we could for the construction contractors, and, and it got down to subcontract level as well, by helping them, by training people. So giving people groundwork experience, giving people basic site experience. Um, and we did that so that we could give them to the contracts and say, here you go, if you need more people, here's some people from the local area that you could use. Um, we held recruitment events, we pushed apprenticeships, um, and we're really proud of the fact 400 people who, who um, worked on, on, our, on our job. And we probably had just over 1,000 people at the peak times working, working on, on the job. And uh, 400 people previously were, were unemployed and never been employed before. One thing we did do, um, which was, and this is outside any statutory um, codes, responsibility, regulations in the UK, we identified two areas. One of the one was the one I showed you before, Chilwell High Road, where there were those independent retail outlets, and one was another small location in a place called Clifton, which I haven't shown you. We identified a number of businesses that were relatively low turnover businesses but they were quite important to the local community. So we did it geographically, and we said what we will do is if you work with us and tell, you what, tell us what your um, business um, income is, so we, we got their books and looked at them, if, if it gets to a certain place, we will top you up while the main construction works are taking place. So we paid um, money to around 100 businesses to keep them going. That, the idea was to keep them going. 
So it wasn't the big, the medium size or the bigger businesses because we said, look, you're going to have to live with this because you're going to benefit at the end. You're going to have to ride it out and at the end, and we'll do it as quick as we can and the best way we can. But at the end, you will benefit from this. So, and you can ride that out. But we felt that there were some small businesses that we didn't want to go to the wall during the difficult construction period. So we, we spent around a million and a half pounds on that sort of thing to keep, keep those businesses going. And that was a local decision that has been used in a couple of other places in the UK since. Um, but we did that because we just felt that we wanted to do that in those areas. I touched on this before. We also did everything else we could with businesses. So we did provide logistical support. We, we, when, when the works were so bad that you literally couldn't get, get, get vehicles to the front door of some businesses, we set up distribution centres in the adjacent area and help goods move, go in and out of their businesses. Um, and we required the contractor to pay for that as well. Um, and we did things like free little, little um, buses to run around areas when construction works was making that the, the, um, the, main, the main works were causing lots of traffic congestion. Not, not massively high investment, but things that were asked for following discussion and we, we were able to, to invest in. Um, and we, did, we actually did a lot of marketing support as well. So, you know, a lot of small businesses are not very good at marketing. Um, so we helped them market it. We helped them find new markets. We, we actually employed a marketing specialist in one, in one period for, you know, I don't know, maybe £40,000 worth of marketing support to help, to help businesses. Set up websites. That was one area. Because obviously they were going through construction works, but they are also going through a period of massive upheaval in the retail market with the advent of internet shopping. So they were, they were getting it from both, both sides. So we did that. Um, and we think it was worth it. Um, we, I think that the conclusion was that um, if we hadn't have done all those things, we wouldn't have had what we've got now, which was um, the public actually think Nottingham's tram is really good. We had a spell during the construction where, the, if you like, the... It was tested whether they thought it was a good idea, and a lot of people hated the traffic disruption, just like you're, you're getting here, you know? They really hated it. Um, and that got to the highest level, because Fred, it just doesn't, doesn't affect... If you always think, how can it have affected the director of that major company this morning when he was trying to get to the railway station to catch his plane to go and catch his flight? But it did. And, it, and it's those sorts, of, those sorts of things happen. But, I think we got to the point very quickly, and I'm talking about only, literally only a few months after, maybe a few weeks after the opening of phase two, that um, all the noise went about the, the impact of the works. It all went, it all just dissolved, and people were using it. And I talked about um, the, poly, the, the, the lady who was in that horrible um, area who decided to join a, a political party, try and get elected. She didn't get elected, actually, but she tried to. Um, She's now a regular tram user. And I, I see her now and again, and I say, hi, Alison, how are you? Um, and I, I don't rub it in, but, but the point is that she, she decided, actually, I hated the construction. She probably says, I'm not sure whether it's cost, cost was right, but many people say that. But she gets how valuable it is to her. And I think that's the best, the best we, could, we could do. Um, so trams are very popular in Nottingham. Um, we have painful times. Overall, they're now seen as a very short, short period of time. It's been a real catalyst for development. Some of the things you're doing, the tram is fundamental to all the pitches that Nottingham makes when we're talking to developers, when we're talking to investors, um, because they respond to it. So it's, it's, it's encouraged lots of other development in the city. Um, and and it's, a, it's really a, a, an arterial route for development, development in the city, and it will continue to be. Money's very tight in the UK, like it is everywhere, but we are looking at further developments. I apologise, this isn't a very good slide, but I think it'll probably do what, um, what we want. The, the lines there, the um, sort of turquoise coloured lines are the, are the current routes. Oh yeah, that's the, there you go, that's the existing network. Um, we're looking at urban extension, so where development has taken place or is taking place, relatively short extensions, possibly part funded by the developer. We're looking at um, a couple of those. We're also looking to go east um, 
into a main a major part of the conurbation that, that the tram hasn't gone to. So you see we focused on the north-south axis and the west. Um, we've got a high-speed rail um, proposals in the UK, the last. Um, the first line has been approved from London to Birmingham, but the second line has got um, two corridors, so it's still going through the, um, the development stage. The plans are to submit the, um, the parliamentary bill for those two new lines, I think in about 18 months to two years. Um, but that, the western side of that route is going the western side of the UK, so Manchester and, and north. The eastern side one comes from Birmingham and through Nottingham. And the stop is in between Nottingham and Derby. And it's a, a place called Toton, which is about two kilometres away from the end of the tram extension. So it would be um, silly if we didn't just extend the tram to, to connect with the HS2 hub. Um, we also think that then gives us the opportunity to go slightly west to get to the motorway, to do, um, to be able to use park and ride to relieve the motorway, motorway junction, a relatively, relatively low cost incremental, incremental development. And then we've got a couple of other pretty grand ambitions that are all really all about if that HS2 station is built and that does become a massive development between the two cities. So we're talking about, I don't know, Disneyland UK or something, something, something like that happening. Then you might be able to connect it in with Derby and we have an ambition to get to Nottingham Airport, which is very badly served, which called it, it's actually East Midlands Airport. Um, but it's very badly served by public transport. Doesn't even have, doesn't have any heavy rail connections at all. Um, they're they're more challenging in terms of business case. Um, but hey, you've got to you've got to think big. Um, and we're also looking at tram trains, so we're using railway corridors. Um, it's not it's not a um, it's not a mode that we've focused on because we haven't really got great great corridors. But if some rationalisation of the heavy rail network takes place as a result of HS2, then some corridors may become available. And that area to the west, um, Stanton and Ilkeston area, is a massive old brownfield site, which you, I think um, you probably get 6,000 houses on. So it's a big area. Um, so that might, that might come into our thinking as well. But again, that's, that's slightly more ambitious. That's my lot. for a very interesting presentation. Okay. Uh, I think that we will just have a short break now and there will be some food in the next room and then we'll come back in half an hour and then that you'll give us around 20 minutes for questions uh, to your sure. very interesting presentation, especially the transformation from an old industrial city into a new yeah. city, a very minded uh, city for the service provider and due to all the local uh, employees that you help connect. So, very interesting and very similar to what we are interested in doing. So, so uh, please have all your questions ready for uh, for the next session. But uh, there will be served uh, some snacks and uh, wine in the next room. Thank you. <laughs>